On May 29, 1919, the astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington traveled to Principe, an island off of Africa's west coast. He was there to witness a total solar eclipse, which would end up becoming the most important solar eclipse in all of modern scientific history. You see, Eddington's expedition had come to test Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. But how did a total solar eclipse help confirm one of the greatest scientific theories ever conceived? It turns out that the answer lies in the geometry of shadows and light. Shadows. These blackish grayish blurs follow us around from the moment we're born, nearly every minute of every single day. Even at nighttime, and in some of the darkest places on Earth, you always cast a shadow. But take a closer look, and you'll see that shadows can produce some fascinating effects on their own. You may have heard of one such effect, the shadow blister effect. Under a certain set of circumstances, two shadows will bulge outward as they approach each other. But you have to have a sharp eye. The effect happens fast. Most times you won't even notice it unless you're trying to make it happen, and even that can be tricky. But once you know how to do it, the effect is pretty easy to create. As you can see, the two shadows tug and bend together. Let's slow it down and take a closer look. See that? The edges of the shadows pull toward each other. Shadow blisters are an effect created by the fundamental geometry of shadows. You've probably heard the terms umbra and penumbra, especially when people are talking about solar eclipses. But all shadows have both of these regions, whether it's a person casting a shadow or the moon casting a shadow. The umbra is the darkest region, the one stretching directly away from the central source of light. I say central because whenever there are multiple sources of light, the direction of the umbra will change based on the average angle of the light sources. The second region of the shadow is called the penumbra. In a shadow with a single light source, the penumbra makes up the outer perimeter of the umbra. It can be smaller than the umbra or larger, depending on the distance and size of the light source. The width and the darkness of a penumbra are pretty important. They're the two factors that really determine whether a shadow blister will even form. The fact that a shadow's penumbra is dimmer than its umbra is why you can create the shadow blistering effect. Two overlapping penumbra create a darker region in between them. Most of the time, they'll create a continuous umbra between the objects but it really depends on how many light sources there are. Like I said, the geometry of the light sources and the shadows changes the overall effect. Watch the penumbra of each shadow. The moment they touch, they create a darker region. On small scales, where the movement is relatively quick over a short distance, it genuinely looks as if the two shadows are pulling towards each other. There's really no large scale equivalent of this effect that we can observe. For instance, during the solar eclipse, the moon has a penumbra that spans hundreds or even thousands of miles. To see any sort of warping in the shadow would be absolutely impossible. All the other shadows on the ground are just way too small and way too dim to match up to the size of the moon's penumbra. But the size of the moon's penumbra is also the reason why most of North America was able to see the eclipse this past August. That is, if it wasn't cloudy, like it was on much of the East Coast. Fortunately, I was out in Oregon and we had perfectly clear skies the entire day. So now that we know how two overlapping penumbra create a shadow blister, let's see what happens when we change the number of light sources. When you only have one source of light, it casts a shadow. Move the light side to side, and the shadow moves with it. Move the light forward and backward, and the shadow gets smaller and larger. But now let's add a second light source. A second shadow appears. And not only that, but this second shadow will move independently of the first. You can see the two regions overlap, and one of the shadows is actually dimmer than the other. Now let's take a look at what happens when the two light sources are actually reflections of each other, such as the sun and a window. A few months ago, I was eating breakfast when I noticed an interesting phenomenon that was doing just that. In this picture, you can see it happening. With the sun overhead, the glass of water was casting a shadow in this direction, but there's a second shadow being cast by the reflection on a nearby window. This creates a fascinating phenomenon. The angle of the sunlight and the reflection averaged out to create a triangular umbra opposite a light source that doesn't even exist, Then that's directly behind the glass of water. Here and here, we can see two penumbra. And now look right here. You see this triangular bright region spreading out directly in front of the umbra? This is the third region of a shadow, called the antumbra. The antumbra is special in a way. If you're standing in an object's antumbra, 
it means that you can see the light source. And if that light source just happens to be the sun, well, let's take a look. This is an image of what's called an annular eclipse. Remember, the moon doesn't orbit Earth in a perfect circle. Its distance varies depending on where it is in its orbit. That's also why some solar eclipses last a minute or two, and others can last five or six minutes. During a total eclipse, the moon is close enough to Earth to completely block out the sun. But during an annular eclipse, the moon is too far away. So instead of blocking out the sun, it creates a so-called ring of fire. In this case, the moon's shadow doesn't reach Earth, and so we view the eclipse from within the moon's antumbra. Each year, the moon moves about 3.8 centimeters away from Earth. That's about 1.5 inches. Right now, we just happen to live in a time when the moon and the sun appear to be the same size in the sky. That's why we can have total solar eclipses. But in about 600 million years, the moon will have moved too far away in its orbit to cover the sun completely. That will be the last time that there can be a total solar eclipse anywhere on Earth. After that, annular eclipses will become the norm, and then eventually, it won't even cover a sliver. So how did the total solar eclipse of May 1919 help confirm Einstein's theory of general relativity? Well, before he set out on his expedition, Sir Arthur Eddington took measurements of the true positions of several stars in the sky, specifically the Hyades Cluster. The sun was moving directly over the Hyades Cluster during the solar eclipse, so they were a good baseline. It also helped that this eclipse lasted for nearly six minutes, which gave Eddington plenty of time to take photographs and take more measurements of the other stars in the sky. To put that in perspective, the eclipse that crossed America in August of 2017 lasted at maximum for just over two minutes. After the eclipse finished, Eddington took his photographs and compared them with the true measurements that he had taken prior to the eclipse. What he found was that there was a gap in the stars. Not only were they slightly spread apart, but they were also further off to the side than where he would have expected them to be had Newtonian physics held up. This helped to prove that Einstein's calculations in general relativity were correct. Space-time truly was curving around massive objects such as the sun. What this means is that if a point of light is behind another massive object, such as a star or a galaxy, it will slightly curve around that object. That means that when you see the light, it's coming at you from a different angle than from where it originated. So even though it looks like the star could be over on this side of the sky, it might actually be straight in front of you or a little bit more to the left. This helps us to understand the density of space-time in any given region of space. In 1919, this experiment could not have been performed without the aid of a solar eclipse. It just goes to show how important the geometry of shadows and light really is. Had that eclipse been an annual eclipse, the sky would have remained too bright for them to take any measurements of the stars. So the next time you see a shadow, try and bend it, just like light bends through space-time. Because remember, it was knowing the geometry of these shadows and of the cosmos that helped lead to one of the most important scientific discoveries in the world. As always, I'm Alex Martin. Here's to all your endeavors.